Good morning. It's Wednesday, January 17th. The war in the Middle East is now 103 days old. I'm Jonathan Shanzer, Senior Vice President for Research at Foundation for Defense of Democracies, and welcome back to the FDD Morning Brief. Political season is heating up here in snowy Washington, but you will not hear partisan politics on the morning brief. We do policy and we do news. Okay, fine. You can say we're swamp creatures when push comes to shove. I mean, we live in Washington, D.C. after all, but the focus here is overseas. We track all the news coming out of the Middle East right now, so you don't have to. It's all summed up here in about 20 minutes, three days a week on the FDD morning brief. The clock is ticking, so let's get going. This morning, I'll be joined by Behnam Ben Talablu, a senior fellow at FDD who works the Iran file. BBT, as we call him, tracks the regime's missiles and rockets. He tracks the regime's drones. He tracks the regime's proxies. He tracks the regime's vulnerabilities, too. And we'll talk to him in approximately eight minutes. Now for the big news today. It finally happened. The Biden administration is now set to reverse its 2021 de-designation of the Iran-backed Houthis terrorist group. The move was three years overdue, but the story is worth reviewing. It started in January of 2021. After coming to terms with its electoral defeat, the outgoing Trump administration made some last minute moves. Among them was listing the Houthis as a foreign terrorist organization, or FTO, at the State Department. The incoming administration was, shall we say, not pleased. The designation was issued at the 11th hour, and the move was designed to be a fait accompli that the Biden administration would just have to accept. At a tense political moment in Washington, the Houthis, who most people had never heard of, suddenly became a political football. Republicans supported the move because, well, it was their president who made the move. Democrats were against it because, well, Trump did it. But more broadly, Democrats didn't want to support the Saudi war against the Houthis because the war had gone poorly, too many civilian casualties, plus Democrats were still fuming about the brutal killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi in 2018 at the hands of the Saudis in the Turkish consulate in Istanbul. Democrats also had the idea of getting back into the Iran nuclear deal, and the Houthis are an Iranian proxy, so the policy appeared to be one of avoidance maybe even appeasement. So the Houthis were removed from the terror list. They were delisted, even though the group clearly met criteria as a terrorist organization. And the reason that the administration cited, sanctions could hinder aid to Yemen. Well, a few years later, after multiple Houthi attacks of aggression carried out upon the order of the Iranian regime, the whole debate appears to be settled. The Houthis were, and still are, a terrorist organization and they will soon be designated as such. Again, this time it will be treasury sanctions as opposed to the FTO designation. Some say that's a weaker measure, and it is in some respects, but it's a belated step in the right direction. In the meantime, here are a few lessons that I think we can probably draw from this experience. One, the partisan bickering over Iran is simply not helpful. The regime and its proxies must be countered equally by both parties here in the United States. Two, the Houthis use human shields in their battle with Saudi, and by the way, in their battle with Yemenis for that matter. Hamas is using human shields in their battle with Israel. The result has been more civilian casualties than anyone cares to see. But maybe it's time that we stop blaming allied militaries battling the proxies of Iran who commit war crimes. Maybe it's time to support our allies in wars that they didn't start. This is how the Iranian regime one day, inshallah, will be defeated. Three, Appeasement does not work. Our failure to hold the Houthis and their terror masters in Tehran to account has come back to bite us. The attacks against our ships in the Red Sea, a clear case of blowback. And finally, it's never a good idea to negotiate with terrorists. It's also not a good idea to delude ourselves. Okay, moving on, here are the other top three big stories of today. Headline one, the European Union announced new sanctions against Yahya Sinwar. Here's the skinny. The man who launched the war in Gaza and who is currently hiding in Gaza tunnels was finally sanctioned by the EU in Brussels. The move won't do much in terms of freezing Hamas assets, and it won't stop the pro-Hamas protests on the streets of Europe. But it is a sign that Europe understands Israel's security predicament, and the move follows law enforcement actions against Hamas in places like Germany and Italy and Switzerland and beyond. 
So what's my take? Slowly but surely, the Europeans must come to realize that Israel's war against Hamas is the same war they have fought and will continue to fight against radicals within the Islamic faith. It's a minority interpretation of the faith, of course, but there is still a large army of jihadists out there. Hamas, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, they're all cut from the same cloth. So let's hope Europe wakes up sooner rather than later. Headline two. Qatar has reportedly secured a deal to send medications to hostages held by Hamas. Okay, fine, it's good news, but seriously, 103 days into the war, what about Qatar's purported influence over Hamas that was supposed to make the group more moderate? You know, the influence, they say, is the reason that they maintained a Hamas headquarters in Doha. They couldn't have used that purported influence earlier how many hostages suffered or even died because they lacked medication for the last 103 days? Say it with me, folks. Qatar is a state sponsor of terrorism masquerading as a humanitarian channel. I probably sound like a broken record, and most people don't even know what a broken record is anymore. But Qatar needs to pay a price for the mess that it created. It should get zero credit for getting medicine into Gaza 103 days after a terrorist attack that it should have prevented. No thank yous here. Qatar should be stripped of its major non-NATO ally status. It should be forced to kick Hamas leaders out of the country, and it probably should be slapped with sanctions too. And finally, headline three, the fighting is over in northern Gaza and hostilities will end soon in Khan Yunus, so says Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant. So now what? The worst of the fighting may be over. The last unconquered major town remaining is Rafah on the Egyptian border. That town could soon be the scene of some tough fighting, but it will also likely be the scene of some interesting negotiations between Egypt and Israel. Egypt has a role to play in the destruction of the tunnels beneath the Philadelphia corridor, as it's known. That's the area along the border of Gaza and the Sinai Peninsula. And then what? I hate to say it, folks, but the war won't end anytime soon. The Israeli army engineers have a ton of tunnels to destroy. New estimates suggest that the entire labyrinth, this is just from news over the last 24 hours, that that labyrinth is more than 350 miles long. It's a lot of tunnels. And even after Israel has killed 9,000 Hamas terrorists, many more are still crawling in the tunnels or have melted away into the Gaza population. The Israelis are signaling that the so-called cleanup phase will not be easy. That's why Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned that the fighting in Gaza could last into 2025. I hope he's wrong. Okay, those are your headlines. I'm now pleased to welcome Behnam Ben Talabu, also known as the notorious BBT. BBT is a top expert on Iran, a sharp dresser, and an all-around good guy. Welcome, Behnam. Good morning. Great to be with you. Thanks, John. All right, Behnam. So for viewers and listeners unfamiliar with your background, just give us a minute or two on your Persian journey here at FDD. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you guys. Uh, next month actually marks my 11-year anniversary uh, of service with FDD. Uh, I like to tell folks in Washington, we have all the scars from all the Iran fights, pre-deal, during deal, post-deal, now allegedly back into some informal, unwritten JCPOA holding pattern. Um, but yeah, I, I voted with my feet on the issue of coming to the think tank that cared the most and had the most impact on Iran uh, as a young Iranian American. I'm a first generation American born to two immigrant parents, ultimately from Iran, one side more political than the other. Uh, but both were already out um, by the time of the revolution or shortly thereafter. Grew up in New York City uh, all my life, zero to 18. Uh, New Yorker through and through. Have some pretty strong opinions about uh, pizza and bagels, despite being neither Jewish nor Italian. But uh, we'll put some of that aside. And uh, it's been an honor to, to live and work on an issue uh, that is very near and dear and close to my heart. Uh, but it's also sometimes heartbreaking to see this stuff, you know, the uh, Iranian culture and history and literature that you love and take so seriously and the Iran of today. So anything I do to help to, to shine a light on the issue uh, and FED has been giving me the opportunity to shine a light on that issue for almost 11 years now. Well, you're doing great work. We very much appreciate all that you do. So let's get into some of the news uh, over the last couple of days. Let's talk about that IRGC missile strike, two of them actually, the other day in northern Iraq. 
why is the regime doing this and why is it not fighting by proxy the way that it usually does? You know, this is an excellent question and really a revolution both in resolve and capability we've seen from the IRGC for almost a decade now. Uh, starting in 2017, the regime broke its almost two decades uh, of preference for proxy warfare that we saw since the end of the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, in the 1990s, there were only a handful of very small Scud missile attacks from Iran at Iraq, even though the war had ended because Iraq was housing the MEK, this Iranian opposition group. Um, ultimately, uh, after the prior to the U.S.-Iraq war in 2003, these strikes had stopped. But starting in 2017, once Iran had developed a, a solid propellant precision strike, short-range ballistic missile capability where they could more accurately target uh, smaller buildings, smaller installations, they began to flex these muscles. And to date, you've had about 14 or 15 post-Iran-Iraq war military operations, six of which now have taken place under the Biden administration, and ultimately eight, now nine if you count the Pakistan one uh, since 2017, since this short-range precision strike revolution. And the trend lines are that Iran has attacked uh, Iraq and Syria almost all the time, Pakistan now the first time. They're striking anywhere from uh, anything from ISIS to Jaysh al Adil uh, to US positions with these missiles. They are striking undefended targets. That is the norm. If Iran is publicly launching ballistic missile operations, it wants them to be as successful as possible. So it's not striking anything that's defended and it wants all the credit uh, for these attacks. So the trend line is more capable missiles, lower bar for the use of force more missile attacks in the future. So get ready for more fire, not less in the Middle East. Yeah, I think that is the trend line. So let me just let me dig, dig in a little bit further here. We talk about the regime that has assets in Iraq and Syria. These are, of course, the militias, the Hashta Shabi, as they call it in Arabic, or the, the popular mobilization units that have targeted the U.S. more than 130 times since October 17th. What is the proper response? You've studied these groups. What is the proper response here for the U.S. if they're trying to cut down on these attacks, if we're trying to deter them? You know, the ultimate proper response is to build a time machine and, and get this issue right from, from 2011, uh, from when we left. Um, but but I, I digress. Uh, you know, first, step one, do no harm. Do not empower these groups. Do not give more material support to Baghdad when you have Baghdad punctured by Iranian proxies. You know, Iran is trying to co-opt religious institutions, political institutions, economic institutions. So one is make sure Baghdad doesn't continue to serve as an economic lifeline. So, you know, no cash to Baghdad, making sure that political aid or economic aid, if it is restored, is conditional on removing PMU commanders or disaggregating uh, people who are in the Ministry of Interior or Ministry of Defense uh, from being able to meet with designated foreign terrorists. So, you know, that's step one. Step two is, you know, don't be afraid to call a spade a spade. Actually, name, name, sanction all of these terror groups that continue to meet with Iranian Quds Force officials, that continue to meet with the world's foremost state sponsor of terror. You can't get American weapons or claim to have credit uh, for stopping ISIS and then also be liaising with the Quds Force and the IRGC. So sanction those who deserve to be sanctioned, sanction those who have developed proxies of their own. Number three is have a better response ratio. Respond to the point of origin for the attacks. Even though Biden has technically used force more times against Iran-backed militias than uh, Trump did, ultimately uh, he has been responding more so in Syria than in Iraq. It's cheaper to respond in Syria, it's harder to respond in Iraq. Syria doesn't have politics, Iraq does, but you need to respond against the point of origin, particularly if you have good ISR. Uh, so you need to stop these strikes from happening. That seems to be something the administration has learned rather belated, but it's something you gotta do. Ultimately after that, uh, you need to uh, go after the militia leader heads. Uh, you know, you had recently the most successful strike against a, a militia commander since the killing of Abu Mehdi al-Mohandas and Qasem Soleimani in 2020. The militias need to know that if they're picking up and fighting and recommending their friends and partners shoot at Americans, America is going to hold them ultimately responsible. And this has to be rinsed and repeated, rinsed and repeated, cutting off political support, tightening economic sanctions, shooting back more of the people who shoot at you, and holding those who all ultimately give these orders uh, literally liable uh, for the impression of resolve to stick. Okay, that's a laundry list. We'll see how far we get through that uh, <laughs> as, as the battle evolves. 
Um, I want to talk about the regime's arsenal, because you've written extensively about the missiles and drones that the regime uses to threaten America and its allies without getting into the full arsenal, which was, of course, the name of your monograph, which everybody should read. Um, but what worries you the most right now when you look at the development of some of Iran's more advanced projectiles? Um, and I fully have to credit you, Jonathan. Uh, you helped come up with the title Arsenal uh, for that monograph and really uh, were a wind beneath my wings in a three-year drafting, editing, researching, and writing process. I hope it's a comprehensive document. Uh, I like to treat it like a Bible. If you see a missile that was tested, go to that monograph. Just recently, you had for the first time ever a medium-range ballistic missile used in a military operation for the first time ever, or I should say on Monday for the first time ever. Uh, that mi missile is detailed in the monograph, its specs, its progenitors, what it uses, its fuel, its range, everything is in there. Please treat it as such. Uh, but what I worry about, Jonathan, and to, to go back to the heart of your question, is that for almost two decades, U.S. intelligence has said Iran has the largest ballistic missile arsenal in the Middle East. Since this time, it has developed a qualitative advantage, not just a quantitative advantage, more precision, better ranges. Uh, more lethality, you know, uh, different kinds of warheads, more mobility, more survivability. There are tunnels. Many of these things can be uh, road mobile. Uh, it's working on developing a space program that could be a cover for an ICBM. So where there was once quantity, there is now quality. And that's precisely why former CENTCOM commander General McKinsey talked about overmatch. You know, this is not the Iran of 10, 20 years ago. These guys have high resolve and an evolving capability. So again, there will be more, not less, missile activity uh, coming to a theater near you. And by the way, uh, General McKenzie will be our guest uh, on the next episode of the FDD Morning Brief. Um, but let me ask you to just drill down one more question here. Uh, when we talk about the more precise weapons that uh, Iran has acquired and developed over the years, we know that they're passing on some of that technology to their proxies, right? This is what the regime has been doing with Hezbollah in Lebanon. They've provided them with what we describe as PGMs, precision guided munitions. The Israelis just uncovered a precision missile factory in Gaza underground. What is the future of the region in light of the proliferation of this technology? Well, this is this really gets to the heart of the matter because Iran is an evolving adversary. There was a time when there was the Karine A, you could stop a ship containing missiles. Some of that stuff still is getting stopped today in the Red Sea with the US, where the Iranians are sending again warheads and missiles and rockets uh, to the Houthis in Yemen. But what the Iranians are doing now is they're learning from the patterns of interception, whether what we're doing at sea or what the Israelis are doing at land. And rather than uh, send whole systems. The Iranians are helping each one of its proxies develop the capability to produce rockets and ultimately missiles. And the Palestinian terror groups, PIJ and Hamas, were the only ones out of Iran's entire acts of resistance to not have access to precision strike technology. The Assad regime has ballistic missiles. The Shia militias in Iraq have ballistic missiles. Hezbollah has ballistic missiles, in fact, has a robust PGM capability. The Iranians help stand up, some through trafficking, some through domestic production, and the Houthis have ballistic missiles. But Hamas only had rockets. With the evidence that was thus far limitedly presented, I have to say, of a PGM facility and components of what they claim was a land attack cruise missile, the Palestinians look to be moving in that direction as well. So what you could once bomb as a missile coming in from a, from a truck, or what you could intercept as a ship containing a whole different munition, you now have to stop an indigenous capability. So it's not just if you successfully seal off the flow, you can successfully stop the conflict. You have to go after domestic war fighting capabilities, which means messier wars in the future. So again, Gaza could be a prelude for what happens next if your real goal is to disarm Iran's axis of resistance. All right, we'll be tracking that. Uh, thank you, Behnam, for joining us today. Thank you. Okay, here's what my FDD colleagues are tracking today. FDD Chief Executive Mark Dubowitz has a new letter to the editors of the Wall Street Journal spelling out how the Biden administration's weaker responses to Iranian aggression in the Middle East has only emboldened the regime in Iran. True, FDD folks have said this for hundreds, heck, maybe thousands of times before, but until the administration seriously reassesses its Iran policy, you'll continue to hear this message from us. 
again and again. FDD economics guru Saeed Ghassaminajad is keeping a close eye on how Iran's currency, the rial, is rapidly depreciating. The markets are responding negatively as Tehran-backed militias and the IRGC sow mayhem across the Middle East. Economic mismanagement is one of the main grievances of the protesters who've come out against the regime more than 5,600 times in the last 15 months. For more on that, visit FTD's daily tracker of the protests by the brave people who seek to topple the regime and who risk their lives to do so. And all of my Iran watching colleagues are watching with mouths agape this morning as Iran's foreign minister, Hussein Amir Abdullahian, has received the red carpet treatment at the World Economic Forum in Davos. CNN's Fareed Zakaria interviewed him and he treated him like a statesman. I'm nauseous. Okay, that's it for today. Read our expert analysis on our website, fdd.org. Read our quick takes on X at FDD and support our work with a tax-deductible donation at fdd.org slash invest. Thanks for tuning in today. I'll see you Friday for another morning brief, as I mentioned, with special guest Frank McKenzie, who until recently was the commander for CENTCOM. General McKenzie is definitely one you're going to want to hear. Until then, I'm Jonathan Shanzer, signing off for FDD.